Hey guys, welcome back to Clinical Physio. I'm Khalid Maidan. What a subject we have for you today. We're going to be discussing how to explain pain to our patients. And in this video, we're going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to help you understand some of the key pathways and principles that goes on when it comes to how and why we experience pain. But then secondly, I'm going to help you become more confident with the ways in which you can explain pain to your patients so that it can help you and them when it comes to your physiotherapy journey. So let's get into it. Let's get clinical. So where do we start? Well, it's got to be with some of the science behind pain, but let's break it down into a more simple context. So the old school method of thinking was that we have different receptors around our body, for example, in our hands, in our shoulders, in our knees, and those receptors would send a message of pain up to the brain when we did something wrong. And it was if that pain message would hit a smack in the face like a 10 ton truck. Ouch. Well, that is indeed old school method of thinking. So what actually does happen in terms of the pain pathways? Well, we still have different receptors around the body, but instead of sending messages of pain up to the brain, those receptors simply send information. So we have mechanoreceptors or mechanical receptors, which are analyzing things like movement, force, and pressure. We have thermoreceptors, which are looking at temperature, and they're helping send information to the brain as to whether the things around us are too hot or too cold. And then it's up to the brain to gain this information and use it to decide whether or not our body is under threat. So if I was going to use a story to try and describe this better, imagine a king who's trying to guard his castle. Well, he has different receptors as well in the form of soldiers. And those soldiers are going to be stationed around different parts of the castle. There are some at the front, some at the back, some on the east side, some on the west side. And those soldiers are going to be constantly feeding the king information about what's going on around the castle to see whether or not it's under attack. So they're going to be looking out to see what's in the distance. Can they hear horses around the corner? And the king has to intercept all of this information and use it to decide whether or not his castle is under threat. And that's exactly how the receptors work in our body. They are the soldiers who are feeding information to the king or in our case, the brain, and the brain then has to decide whether or not that information poses a threat to our body or not. Okay, so information is being sent from all different parts of the body up to the brain. What happens next? Well, if the brain then decides that that information does pose a threat to the system, the brain will send a message of pain back down the body to the area where the threat came from. And that pain message is designed to make us do something different, to make us either react to the pain threat or to take us away from the pain threat. So for example, if the information sent from my finger up to the brain tells me that my finger is close to something too hot, the brain will send a pain message back down so that I move my finger away from the hot surface. Or if I twist my knee falling down the stairs, the message of pain will be sent from the brain down to my knee so that I protect my knee and I don't move it. And similarly with our king in his castle, if the message that he is getting is that there are horses close to the castle, he will send a message of pain down to that side so that all the soldiers in the area get ready to fight. So to summarize, pain is not the message coming in, it's the message going back out. It's the message that the brain sends down to the rest of the body when the information it has received makes it think that there is a threat to our system. And this is brilliantly summarized by the pain expert Lorimer Mosley when he defines pain as a multiple system output activated by the brain based on perceived threat. Beautiful. So now that we've discussed the science, Let's take a deeper look at many other different factors that can play a part in how and why our brain perceives information to be a threat, because it has to do this alongside so many other things going on in our life. Let's take mood, for example. If we were in a state of panic or anxiety, we are much more likely to perceive anything going on around us to be a threat compared to if we were happy, confident, and self-assured. Let's take a plumber 
who's at risk of being made redundant from work. Our brain is much more likely to perceive excess movement in our back to be a threat because of the potential impact to our future, to our income and our employment if we did hurt our back. How about memory? Well, let's take the king. If there was an attack on the east side of the castle three years ago, the king is much more likely to feel threatened by the sound of horses coming from the east side tomorrow. And when it comes to humans, if we hurt our back six months ago when we were trying to pick something up from the floor, our brain is much more likely to feel threatened about the need to pick something up from the floor in the future. And therefore, the brain is much more likely to send the message of pain down to the back when it recognises that we're about to bend forwards. And we find in clinical practice that there are so many other factors that can affect how our brain perceives information to be a threat. I remember, for example, patients who have been going through a bereavement or a difficult life event such as a divorce at the same time that their pain started. I remember patients who had been living in very challenging social environments, such as poor accommodation or in a very dangerous neighbourhood. And so we can see that all these things are going to stack up and make a difference as to whether our brain perceives information around it to be a threat or not. So how does this help us explain pain to our patients? Well, it helps us show our patients that any pain stimulus can be interpreted differently from one person to another depending on their mood, life circumstances or memory, to name a few reasons. It helps us point out that pain is not simply a yes or no answer. It's not as simple as whether tissue is being damaged or not. And it's really important, as we said earlier, to point out to patients that pain is not the message going up, it's the message coming back down. And I find that the analogy of the king and his castle a really good one to use with patients because patients can really put themselves in the position of the king and they can really see how the king would react differently to his castle being under threat based on so many factors going on around him. So now, how about that topic which can be really difficult to discuss with patients? Persistent pain. Well, for me, I go back to the king in the castle. And I can explain to patients that if the castle continues to be attacked for a long period of time on the east side, the king is going to feel much more vulnerable about the east side of the castle compared to other sides. He might be going outside the east side to see what's happening out there more frequently. He might put more guards, more soldiers or more receptors on that side of the castle. And he might build up more defence mechanisms such as a moat or an extra bridge on the east side of the castle because he is continually worried by the east side of the castle. He feels continually threatened by the east side of the castle. And so how does that happen in our body? Well, if the same area of our body has been feeling under threat for a long period of time, it will feel very different to other areas of our body. So let's say we have had back pain for six months. Our brain is much more likely to perceive different movements in our back to be much more threatening than different movements in our shoulder, for example. And if our back is continually threatened, by the movement of bending, our brain is going to feel much more vulnerable about bending compared to other movements. We can then go on to explain to patients with persistent pain that it might be that we need to address the perception of the threat rather than the threat itself. When it comes to the king in the castle, we may need to address the perception of why he continues to feel threatened by the east side of the castle rather than to continuously make structural changes to the east side of the castle. And when it comes to patients, we may need to trial things such as cognitive behavioural therapy or graded exposure, where we gradually increase the amount of bending that the patient performs in the back to demonstrate to the brain that perhaps the threat isn't as bad as we once thought. And so hopefully these ideas about addressing the perception of the pain can help you with your advice and education and help your patient get more on board with your physiotherapy. So guys, if you've enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button below or share this video with someone who would love to see it. And if you'd like to know more about us, you can follow us on our best social media platform, 
at Clinical Physio on Instagram or check out our website www.clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid Maidan. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today. We'll see you soon right here on Clinical Physio.